I grew up in a movie house. My father was a projectionist. My grandfather was a projectionist. And uh, on the weekends, I uh, would watch triple features in the Royal Theater on the north side of Chicago. And the gentleman that owned the theater was an old Irishman who felt that John Ford walked on water. So from uh, 8 till about 15 years old, I saw The Quiet Man 200 times, The Searchers 200 times. Anyway, that was my window to the world. And uh, even though I was trained as a musician, I always felt that uh, film was a, a sacred opportunity to communicate. And it encompassed all the arts of expression in terms of composition, drama, literature, etc. So at some point in the late 60s, after much success in the recording business, David Picker, who was the president of UA, called me and said, would you like to make a film? And I said, well, it's a unique opportunity, but my life is quite under my control. I'm not, uh, it's a collaborative art, making records or making film, but I have a lot of freedom and control in the record business. Uh, I pick the material, I arrange the material, I'm responsible for the recording, the marketing. I would very much like to make a film. And I was very interested in this story, which was based on a true event of a motorcycle policeman that was uh, shot and killed in Phoenix, Arizona. And the struggle of an individual, no matter in what circumstances he finds himself, uh, does the best he can. That's right, Harv. Somebody died over loneliness. Sometimes it's just that simple. What about the murder weapon? I don't know nothing about that. All I know is that Willie killed Frank because he was old and scared, tired and lonely. And that's really the theme for the movie for me. I and mean, that's what it represented because no matter where life finds you or no matter what circumstances you inherit, um, it's, it's a noble achievement to live and die by your principles. Oh, no, Zipper. It was just laying there, Big John. I had to take it. What was he going to do with all that money? If it hadn't been just laying there, I wouldn't have taken it. You believe that, don't you? That kid Zemko was going over. Zipper, you were going to let him. You know what that makes you? Do you? I thought it was important because at that time, law enforcement, policemen, police officers, and the institution in terms of Vietnam were under severe attack. Good morning, you fascist. You honkies. You killers. You bigots. You fags. You pinkos. That was my intention in making the project and taking on this story. But uh, with regard to when it got to the Cannes Film Festival, it was perceived as a fascist film and a fascist statement. I had met Connie Hall through a production manager named Tom Shaw, who had done all the John Huston, a lot of John Huston and Richard Brooks films, because Connie was a cameraman on a film called The Professionals. So Connie came into my music office in LA, and he says, I will set up the interviews for the new cameraman. Uh, this is a very small independent film. You can't afford to pay me. And I said, you know, I want to do this non-union. I want to take two station wagons and go to the desert, <laughs> and I want to I don't want to have all this baggage. And Cameron said, well, I don't know if we can do that. I said, sure, you can have one panel truck for your equipment, but we're going to take two station wagons, and, and we're going to do this very efficiently because I've only got a few weeks and, a, and a less than a million dollars, a million dollars to make a film. At this time, Conrad's 
life partner was Catherine Ross, who was a charming, beautiful, talented lady. And uh, Conrad came in with Catherine, and he said, where are you going to shoot this? And I said, well, we're going to do it in the desert. <laughs> we're going to Scottsdale. And uh, he says, well, I've got a cameraman for you. And his name is Conrad Hall. And I said, you're kidding. And he says, no, let's go, to, let's go make it. Do you have any money to pay me? And I said, well, you're just, you're not in the budget. I mean, you're, I think his average salary at that time might have been ten or 20000 a week. So I gave Conrad my director's salary. <laughs> I, made, I made $1 on this movie. So. You hear anything, Wintergreen? Sir? Uh, Conrad no. had spent... 20 years of his career, from combat, TV series, to the professionals in black and white, stretching the envelope. And he had a visual style. But I remember telling Conrad that the most important film to me was The Searchers. And uh, I th the cameraman was William Clothier. And he says, oh my god. I've spent 20 years getting away from that cinemascope, oversaturated color. And that's, that's John Ford. And I said, here's what we're going to do, Conrad. We will use any lens selections you have on interiors, and we will push the film, and we'll filter. We'll, you can go crazy on the interiors, but the exteriors are my turf, and this is a Western. And I just can't tell you how many days we ended the shoot going, Bill Clothier. Eat your heart out. This is Conrad Hall. Look at that. Yeah. So we shot the clouds, the sky, the buttes the, in Monument Valley, and it was, a, it was a great experience. I had deep affection for Conrad. Had a great relationship with Robert Blake. This gave him an opportunity to get a television series. Mitchell Ryan went on to have a television series. He was a friend of Robert's. But the, the, the two most exciting guys, actually, in terms of the cast, were uh, Elijah Cook, just that day, I come off the superstition, and, and just that day, I opened the door to the shack, and what do you got? that's when I saw him. And Royal Dano. We haven't got anything. There hasn't been a murder. The man shot himself. And we're not interested in your pork chops, your loaves of bread, or your notes. Get that through your head. It was a great experience. Uh, having a beer with them and watching them drink every night and hearing about their 30, 40 years in the business. If you look close, there is a scene where I guess it's the first footage ever, ever shot of this fella, and I wanted to give him a speaking part, but I ran out of money. There's a full-on shot because I wanted to create a character for Nick Nolte. And Nick was a very uh, powerful kid. He was just starting out. He was in his 20s. And I was very impressed with him. And I'm seen him, I've seen him and talked to him. And he said, God, you never used me. And I, we ran out of money. And we, in fact, we arrest a girl at that commune. And then we never see her again because the wow. U, UA people were starting to get nervous. They came out and they said, Mike, you're 10 pages behind. And I just ripped all the pages out of the script. I said, we're on schedule now. And it took out the whole romantic young lady in the movie. I took all the footage up to my ranch in Montana and I set up the movieolas and I built a screening room and uh, took six to eight months putting the film together and writing the score. And uh, then I came to LA, recorded the score, and I think we still brought this film in under a million dollars. I'm very proud of this film and the relationships that came out of it, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. I felt it was an important American film, and at the time, it was uh, in, important what we were trying to say in that story. <laughs>